Well, good morning, everyone. Just waiting to see if anybody shows up to the live stream today. This is the first in a series of monthly live streams that I'll be doing. This one uh, is, of course, March 23rd, 2024. And we're going to try to do these every fourth Saturday of the month. So I'm pretty sure that every month has at least four Saturdays. So some of you, of course, may watch this later on when it's uh, posted on YouTube. But if you happen to remember that I'm going live right now, I hope you'll join me. But in the meantime, I'm going to talk about something that uh, is very, I've just been thinking about this lately. And uh, first, I'm going to start my teleprompter up here because I've got some notes that I want to refer to. I want to talk about how music connects to everything. Now, music, of course, is described as the universal language. And anywhere you go in the world, there's going to be music. And what I wanted to talk about here for a little bit, just to get this live stream started, is how music is connected to virtually every area of human knowledge, every area of human endeavor. Now, if you ask most people, what is music? Well, they're going to describe it perhaps as an art form. And it's true that the influence of music, it transcends traditional boundaries. And it, but in a sense, music connects to everything. It connects to every subject that you might be studying in school. And that's something that I, I hope to explore further in uh, some of the videos here on At Home With Music. So for now, I'd, I'd like to give you a quick overview of some of the things that I would like to talk about more in depth. So this is going to be kind of like the, the 30,000 foot view of how music connects to everything. It connects to every subject. So, so take, for example, music and mathematics. Think about the connection between music and math. You know, mu uh, this should be pretty obvious to some of you who have studied music. You realize that Music is governed by mathematical principles. I obviously could spend a lot of time talking about this, and I hope to do so. But something as basic as rhythm deals with mathematics. you got to know your fractions when you start talking about time signatures. And harmony, the relationship between notes, it follows precise numerical relationships, uh, the intervals in between notes in a scale. Now, to explain this, more fully it would take way more time than I have right now and still a lot more research that I need to do in order to speak, speak knowledgeable. So connection between music and math There's also a connection between neuroscience, study of the brain and music. I'm going to run my thing is going a little too fast there. I'll slow it down. <laughs> I'm not actually reading this. It's just my notes and occasionally my notes are getting ahead of me. So we talked about the connection between music. If you're studying music, you're really studying math. If you're studying music, you're also going to be studying neuroscience, or if we could call this music and the brain. There's a direct connection between neuroscience and music. And perhaps some of you have learned about this or read about it. The study of music offers valuable insights into the working of the human brain. And neuroscientists have long been fascinated by the cognitive processes involved in musical perception, musical performance, and musical appreciation. So when you perceive that there's music playing, it affects your brain. When you hear it performed, it affects your brain. If you yourself are involved in the creation of music, that too affects your brain. Maybe you've been online and you've seen uh, uh, videos about how playing music is good for your brain, the effects that playing music has on your brain. So music can affect your brain <laughs> by hearing it, by appreciating it, by uh, performing it. You know, I, I have found that uh, my brain power, as it were, has grown as I've introduced myself or discovered new types of music. Stop, my notes are going away from me again. <laughs> Let's see, where are we? 
Uh, let's see. We'll just leave it right there for now. Sorry about all those interruptions. I'm. This is my first live stream in a long time, and I'm still working out some of the bugs. <laughs> but anyway, when I discover a new style of music that I haven't heard before, or I discover a new artist that I've never listened to before, and I think, wow, their music is really good. Nice melodies, beautiful chord changes, nice arrangement, good lyrics. Well, I, this just has a, a pleasant effect on my brain. You know? And, uh, you know, I talked recently about going to see Voces 8, the, the famous vocal group from England. Now, I, I'll tell you, their music can really move you emotionally. And, of course, that that's part of what it is doing. It's affecting your brain. Let's see. What else did I have to say about that here? Let's see. Okay, we'll start those down. Well, there's a lot more that I could say about how music affects your brain. So we've, we've talked about the connection between mathematics and music. So if you're studying math... If you're studying music, you're studying math. If you're studying music, you're, believe it or not, you're entering into the field of neuroscience. I bet you didn't realize that. But the research suggests, and perhaps all of you out there have experienced this, that music can have a profound effect on your emotions. It can have an effect on your memory. And there's this whole occupation known as music therapy. Now, that's something that, frankly, I was trained as a classical musician. And then later on, I branched out into popular music and uh, accompanying singers and choirs and so on. And I didn't know there was such a thing as music therapy. But you have this whole occupation known as music therapy. And what music therapists do is they use the power of music to engage the mind and the body and the emotions. So that's a fascinating subject that I hope to explore further. Now, fortunately, uh, over the years, I've come to know a few folks that do music therapy. It's a very powerful thing. And I'm, I would really like to learn more about it and then share that knowledge with you. Because uh, the idea that music could be used as part of therapy, I mean, you think of therapy, you know, going and talking to your psychologist or your psychiatrist, but to use music as part of that therapy, well, that's certainly a new idea to me. But I've begun to learn more about it, and I plan to share what I've learned here at, at Home with Music. Now, if you study music, and this one should be pretty obvious, you're studying history pretty obvious connection between the study of music and the study of history. After all, it's impossible to study the history of music without considering generally what was going on in the world at that time. You know, music is deeply intertwined with culture and society. So if you study the music of a particular time period, then you can gain insights into the values, the beliefs, the social structures of that era. You think about the types of music that were popular during the Renaissance or the types of music that were popular in the Baroque period, the Romantic period, the Classical period. You can even extend that into the types of music now that have been popular in popular music, you know, we, we had early rock and roll, which perhaps sounds a little bit primitive to those of us listening with modern ears today, but that was a revolutionary thing. And you can even go back further and listen to old folk music and uh, just all kinds of different stuff. And then there's the songs from the Great American Songbook. But, uh, you know, you have the, there's like a whole catalog of songs that were written during World War II. I've, I've got some old sheet music that my mother-in-law gave me because her mother was in vaudeville. Now, there's another thing I'd love to tell you more about. 
That was the back in the days when the only way you could see a live performer was to go see the live performer. You couldn't watch him on video. There were no, you know, no TV or anything. Anyway, all these songs reflected the history of what was going on at the time. If you study the lives of the great composers, you'll begin to see how they were affected by what was going on at the time. There's a famous story about Beethoven when he wrote his third symphony and Napoleon was active at the time. And uh, that would be another interesting story to tell you about how Beethoven changed the dedication of that symphony because of what was happening historically around him. And then you think about the composers that were active during the time of the Soviet Union, and some of the things that they had to deal with. So a lot to talk about there. My notes, once again, are running away from me. Oh, yes. We could talk a lot about the political and social movements that were reflected in the music of the time. Think about protest songs and how they played a significant role in various historical movements like the civil rights movement or the anti-apartheid movements in South Africa. You know, if you analyze these songs, it can provide valuable, valuable perspectives on the issues, the sentiments, the struggles of the time. Now, another thing, if you're studying music, that you can't escape is the effect of technological advancements on music. The evolution of music technology, if you like. And uh, that, of course, parallels broader technological advancements throughout history. You know, you remember uh, the invention of the printing press. And that, of course, enabled the distribution of not only written material, but sheet music. And what it did was it uh, caused more people to have access to music. And it influenced musical composition. It influenced performance. It was pretty much standard for everybody to have a piano <laughs> in some of the middle class homes, and upper class homes of the day, the Victorian era. And all the young ladies learned to play piano and that's how they, they made music. They read the sheet music. So everybody had access now to music. Now, we, we've become very much aware of how the technological advances have effect, affected uh, music today. Music is now recorded. You've got videos. You've got all kinds of music here on YouTube and on other platforms. Um, an artist nowadays can basically get themselves out there and build a fan base without waiting for the major record labels and companies to help them do that. And the technology has also affected the creation of music, a huge subject there. I've been, uh, when I first started as a musician in the studios, I'm going to stop my notes here so they don't run away from me again. <laughs> I first started as a musician playing sessions in recording studios. And uh, while I didn't make a full-time living doing that, I did pre perform on several recording sessions. And back in those days, we were recording to two-inch tape, big giant tape machines. And all the musicians, we were in the room together, separated by baffles, and we had to play it right. And if we made a mistake, we had to go back to the beginning and start over. Well, it gradually evolved. And that's, that's a, an amazing story to tell, how the technological advances changed the way music was created, the way music was recorded. You can talk about the, the history of the Beatles and all the studio innovations that they uh, trumpeted or that they triumphed or <laughs> that they did. You know, all the different things they did became state of the art. And nowadays, everything is digital. Now, I've just kind of jumped from the 60s to the, the 2000s, but I made that transition as well because I owned a recording studio from 1990 and I still have the studio today, although it's it's uh, pretty much devoted to producing content for YouTube now. It's all digital. 
I use what is known as Pro Tools. I don't have any tape machines in the studio that I use to actually do any recording. Well, I actually do have an old cassette deck because uh, when we were switching from audio that was on tape to audio that was digital, a lot of folks were saying, hey, I've got these cassettes. Can you can you change them to CDs for me? I said, yeah, sure, I can do that. Or I've even done that with, with people's old LPs. I've got a turntable that uh, I haven't used in years now, but it's still there in case somebody wants to take an LP and turn it into a CD or turn it into a MP3 that can be put up on YouTube or Facebook or any other of the amazing platforms that we have today. So when you're studying music, you're studying technology, technological advances. So much that we could talk about, so much that uh, is so very interesting about what has happened to this whole world of music that we're all involved in because of all the technological advances. When you study music, you're dealing with global perspectives. Music, as I mentioned, is a universal language. Studying music from different cultures and regions, well, that can offer insights into global historical contexts. You can compare music and, anal and analyze music from various parts of the world. And that can highlight similarities, differences, and exchanges between cultures. It'll give you a more nuanced understanding of historical interactions and globalization processes. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, well, Lord willing, we will get to those things in uh, future videos. So music, it connects everything. You think about every subject that you study. I mean, you might be thinking, well, what about PE? What about physical? Well, a pianist or any instrumentalist is, in a sense, an athlete. You know, you've got to work on your technique. I got my keyboard right down here. And you've got to work on proper posture. If you're a singer, you've got to work on proper breathing and support of the diaphragm. There's all kinds of physical things you've got to think of. If you're in poor shape physically, that's going to affect how you perform musically. But if you eat right and get proper rest and exercise, that, I believe, is going to have a beneficial effect on your performance as a musician. I know when I was doing shows um, from, I'm kind of largely retired from playing shows, but when I was doing that, that that's physical labor. <laughs> if any of you out there are gigging musicians, or if you know somebody who goes out and plays gigs, they got to haul their equipment and set things up, set up the sound system, and they're running around and getting hot and sweaty, especially if it's summer in Florida. And then they might have to play for three or possibly four hours with a few breaks in between. And then got to tear everything down, load it back up into the vehicles, and you may end up driving a couple hours to get home. Now, I've, I've done that thousands of times, and I had to be in shape. And actually, the I was in the best shape of my life when I was a gigging musician. Now, I hope I haven't fallen too far. But I know that if I were to start doing those type of shows again, I'd have to do a little extra working out in order to get myself back in shape, in order to be able to do shows like that. But anyway, it, music has an effect on your physical being. There's, there's a lot about playing the piano that I haven't even gotten into yet, about proper posture and how long should I practice? You know, Do, do I need to, to work until my fingers hurt? No, no, no. You don't want to do that. You don't want to be straining. Anyway, I'm, now I'm giving you hints about what I'm going to be talking about in the future. All right. Now, something I want to emphasize to those of you who are homeschool teachers, and I hope that some of you will get a chance to see this live stream later on, but if you include music in your curriculum, and I certainly would encourage you to do that, you probably already realize that it's going to enhance learning across multiple subjects. Studying music and music education, that can improve your, your students' cognitive skills, their academic performance, and even their social development. 
And studying music is going to help your students develop critical thinking. They will develop their creativity. And, and this is not emphasized enough, I think, in music teaching. They will develop collaborative skills that are essential for success in pretty much any endeavor. And so, you know, I always encourage people when they're studying music, don't just study it by yourself, but study it and then find other musicians that you can collaborate with. If you're a if you're a keyboard player like me, I find great fulfillment in coming alongside singers, for example, and accompanying them, or being part of a group. I'm I'm part of the uh, team that plays music in our church every Sunday. I sit back there behind the grand piano and just kind of tinkle away, but I'm part of a team, and it it's tremendously beneficial to me mentally. It's very enjoyable. It helps me grow as a musician. I get to encourage the other musicians. They get to encourage me. We get to work together. It's just nothing like being part of a team. Maybe some of you have been choir members. And there's just something very special about being in a choir or being in some kind of performing group. So I encourage anybody, any of you out there that are learning music, don't keep it as a solitary endeavor, but seek to share it with others. Even if you're just playing for your friends and family in the living room where they're, they're gathering around the piano and you can play a song and they can sing it. That's what it's all about. All right, I'm going to back up a little bit here. All right, that's, that's basically what I wanted to share with you today. This is a sort of a test this live stream. Uh, I see, the, see that there's a few of you that are watching and I appreciate it. I hope that uh, many of the rest of you will get to see this on the replay when it shows up on YouTube. Keeping it short today, I just wanted to share those thoughts with you. And uh, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, uh, anything that you'd like to see me talk about, then uh, I appreciate that. You can leave those in the comment section or you can leave a comment here during the live stream. In future, I'm um, hoping to do things a little bit more. We might have some guests come on. We'll also analyze some songs, talk about some of the things that are going on in the world of music. Yeah, another thing I wanted to do, wanted to uh, to share with you some of the, you, you've probably seen in some of my video videos, uh, books that I've got behind me here. And you might be thinking, what? What are all these books he's got? What are these all about? So I thought it'd be fun to, to share with you some of the books I have in my library and why I've got them. Well, as you can see here, I've got bass guitar for dummies. <laughs> I never quite picked it up. Uh, but if I ever want to learn bass guitar, I've got one around here somewhere. Oh, there it is. It's over there in the corner and you can't see it. But uh, I've, pay, I've played around on the bass guitar. But... Uh, if I ever really wanted to seriously try to learn it, you know, there we go. Bass guitar for dummies. That's just one of the many books. Uh, if you can see, when you see in some of my videos, I've got a whole bunch of bookshelves right behind me here. Several books that I've had for many years. Some of them date all the way back to my college days. Some of them date all the way back to the late 60s when I first started learning piano. So. I'll share some of those with you and, and why I've got them and why I find them valuable. And I'll make some recommendations to you as far as some books that I think would be beneficial to you as you continue your music education. All right. Well, since I'm sitting here in front of my keyboard, see if you recognize this. Yep, that's my theme song. theme song. I, I used to know how to play it. I got to play it way up here. <laughs> All right. Well, we've been at this for about 24 minutes, so I think that's long enough for today. Oh, somebody asked a question here. I'm going to answer that. If I followed your videos from the beginning, can I learn how to play the piano? Well, yes. 
I have a series, I have a playlist on my channel called Music Basics. And if you start from the beginning there, it will, I mean, it starts from the beginning. Like, where is middle C? You know, where are the, the white keys, the black keys? Takes you step by step through the very basics of the keyboard. So it's keyboard based. And if you get to the end of that, you will be able to play simple songs with chords and melody. And then I have a series that's following that called From Ears to Fingers. So we don't want to be musicians who can only play if they're reading from the music. You want to be able to read music. I strongly advocate that you learn to read music at least the treble clef. That's all you really need to learn at first in order to play songs. Because you, you're basically going to be playing chords in your left hand and melodies with your right or some basic chords in your right hand and some bass notes in the left. Nevertheless, if you learn your chords and you learn to read the treble clef, you can learn to read lead sheets. Lead sheets are just the melody and the chord symbols. That's what you learn in music basics. Then from ears to fingers, it's a fancy way of saying, I'll teach you how to play by ear. Now, a lot of people think that playing by ear is this mysterious thing that only the gifted know how to do. But in reality, it's a skill that you can acquire. I started out like most piano students by learning music strictly by reading the notes. But I quickly found that if I could listen to the piece I was supposed to learn, that made it easier for me to learn it more quickly. And then if I was going to play a song that didn't have a written out accompaniment, I needed to learn how to play by ear. So that's from ears to fingers. So, yep, you can learn um, from the beginning to play the piano, but you're not going to be learning the classical method. I must emphasize that. You can learn that from any good piano teacher. I can, I can show you how to find a good piano teacher, but that is an entirely different musical discipline that I don't teach. I could, I do, and have taught that. But um, this, this way... You can have a lot of fun. You become very creative. You learn how to play basically any song that you want to play and play it in any key. I got a message here from Lolly. She says, thank you for sharing. I would like to understand using different scale types and chords with respect to different musical genres. Well, that's something that we've gotten into as well. Uh, I have a series of videos on the different scale types. You know, for example, you have the um, natural minor, you have the melodic minor, you have the harmonic minor. And of course, it, like anything music, once you open up that musical can of worms, it can get pretty, pretty complex. Not complex, it's just a lot to deal with, a lot to, you know, step by step concept by concept, you can figure it out. And so you learn which chords are a part of which keys. And in the minor keys, of course, there's different chords depending on which type of minor scale you use. Anyway, there, I have a lot of videos on my channel that explain how all of that works, how you can use the different scale types and chords with respect to different music genres. Um, in fact, my most recent videos, I talk about the 2-5-1 chord progression. 2-5-1. And I show you how you can kind of jazz it up a little bit, and, you'll, and it starts to help you learn how to play jazz chords. And then another thing I'm going to do is show you where the 2-5-1 progression shows up in classical music, because it's, it's all over the place. <laughs> Anyway, oh, and the uh, fellow who asked about, uh, or the viewer, I, I can't unfortunately pronounce the name. <laughs> I apologize. I'm not even going to attempt it. But so thank you. I'll try that. So I hope that you uh, are able to learn some good things from my Music Basics series. I appreciate the question. I appreciate all the questions and comments. And... Uh, I think we're going to end right at this point. We'll be back. Uh, oh, my goodness. When is the last Saturday of April? The fourth Saturday of April. I'm going to look at my calendar here real quick, and I'll tell you the exact date. Naturally, I will post it online. 
So my next live stream is going to be Saturday, April 27th at 11 a.m. And I appreciate those of you who have come on to join me today, those of you who have responded and asked questions. And uh, let your friends know, every fourth Saturday of the month at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'll be here. And uh, the basic format we're going to follow, I'll have some words to share about a particular subject. Today I talked about how music connects to everything. And I'll have something interesting to talk about Next time, I'll show you some of the books that I have here in my library, and maybe we'll take a song and take it apart. And if you have any more questions, then uh, I encourage you, you can come into the live stream and ask those questions. I can see them as they come up here. I appreciate that very much. All right. So what time is it now? It's 1130. We've been on for half an hour. I think that's pretty much how long these live streams are going to go, unless we get really inspired or I get a lot of questions. So thank you again for watching. I really appreciate it. Be sure to check out my regular videos. I make every effort to upload at least twice a week, sometimes three times. And uh, sometimes it's Tuesday, Thursday. Sometimes it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It's basically, uh, I don't have a, a set schedule, but uh, I mean, I have a set schedule. I try to get out uh, two or three videos a week, but Sometimes, depending on how long the video is or how involved it is, it might might be a little bit of a delay because I want what I put out here for you to be helpful, to be done correctly. <laughs> I've made a couple of mistakes along the way, but fortunately, I've got some very alert viewers who say, wait a minute, you said left hand and you put out your right hand. Yep, I did that in one of my most popular videos. And I said, yep, I get my right and left mixed up sometimes. Anyway, that's enough rambling. I look forward to speaking to you in my next regular video and on the next live stream. Thank you for joining me today. And uh, if you're watching this after the fact, I hope you'll stick around and check out my other videos and subscri subscribe to the channel. And uh, I look forward to talking to you later. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye.